Good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who uh, I haven't yet met, I'm Jenny Waldman, Director of Art Fund, and it is my enormous pleasure to welcome you to our first event of 2021. Through our events, we hope to bring you closer to the art and museums that Art Fund is able to champion because of your generous support. And of course, it's not just art collections that Art Fund supports. Today, we'll be looking at some of the remarkable medical and science collections in UK museums. And that seems especially timely uh, to be speaking about medicine right now as the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination programme is underway. And of course, COVID-19 is never too far from our thoughts. Um, for this discussion, I hope we can come away with a deeper understanding of the role our museums play in charting medical history and the developments we're currently living through and how collections can be a source of knowledge and analysis and inspiration for generations to come. I'm delighted to be joined by Sir Ian Blatchford, Director of the Science Museum Group, who will help me introduce this event. And um, before we hand over to my colleague, Rachel Browning, who and our very special panelist guests, Colin Gale, Steph Shulton, and Katie Barnett, who Rachel will introduce properly later. So let's kick off. Um, this is such a huge and fascinating topic, and we could uh, speak about it for longer than the hour that we've got. So Ian, thank you for being here. The Science Museum and its collection encompasses objects and stories around technology, science, computing, engineering, astronomy, and more, and of course is known worldwide. And in November 2019, I think it was, you opened the spectacular new galleries, Medicine the Welcome Galleries. And I think it's now the largest uh, museum space dedicated to, muse to medicine in the world. And it's certainly one of the reasons that the Science Museum was crowned joint winner of Art Fund Museum of the Year 2020. Congratulations once again. And um, I'd like to start by asking you about the background to the medicine collections and how the new galleries came about. Well, thank you, Jenny. And first of all, thank you for inviting me and thank you to all your patrons who are listening because, you know, the Art Fund does great work, but particularly you're one of the things giving hope to the whole sector. So, you know, uh, we really appreciate everything you're doing. Um, so the background really is um, in the late 70s, um, Henry Wellcome's collection came on long-term loan to the Science Museum. And it, it uh, since then, we've looked after it, but also uh, built our own collection. So there are about 150,000 items, and it is by far the largest medical history collection in the world. And in my highly objective opinion, the best. But also because of it, I've spent a lot of my time visiting in the UK and around the world medical collections, and they are a thing of great beauty. Um, and the reason we decided to change the galleries is that the previous galleries um, were, it seemed to me, very small, given the importance of the collection, but also they were very, very chronological, um, which, believe me, a 2,000-year history of medicine is an incredibly boring experience, because, first of all, they were very old-fashioned. It was very much a story of men, there were no stories of patients, but also the history of medicine is a funny one because uh, like a lot of uh, innovation, there are periods when there's a lot to say and then there might be 200 years before anything new happens. And worst of all, every, everyone listening will know it's always a very bad sign when you visit a gallery, when the navigation system has yellow arrow, arrows on the floor to tell you how to visit, you know instantly you're doomed. So um, the new galleries are three times the size of the old ones. Mm -hmm. And also it seemed to me, because I'm, you know, I'm a, the ex VNA deputy director in the Science Museum, it seemed to me that actually, it was such an amazing story where, you know, my burning passion is the meeting of art and science. This collection needed to breathe. That's what we wanted to achieve. Fantastic. And, and I think, I mean, the new galleries are wonderful and they feel very inviting. As you say, there's room to breathe, but also the interactive displays are well, they remind me of my childhood where I had to be kind of dragged away from the science museum because I wanted to press all the buttons. Um, <laughs> But can, can you tell us more about um, how you sought to tell the new stories and, and the curatorial decisions that went into planning the displays? Yeah. Well, so having decided that we wouldn't tell a chronological story, we then faced some other challenges. So even though the galleries are three times the size of the old ones, that's still not big enough to display the whole thing. And I said to the creators early on, 
let's not display the whole collection, otherwise we will drive people demented. And, and, and I suppose our, our starting point is something that we do, which is never seen, which is the enormous investment in audience research to understand actually what people understand about the science, but also new stories to tell. And so the thing that I'm particularly proud of in the new galleries is that the story of patients is even more prominent than the story of doctors. And, and, and that's because um, we wanted people to be able to see themselves and also to understand something which is the great, in a way, new story of medicine, that the patients are the heroes, that actually they're the ones that take the experimental drugs. They're the ones, especially if you look at the history of anatomy uh, or, or surgery, who take the terrifying risks involved in medicine. And so um, it was a wonderful opportunity to take the mantras of diversity and inclusiveness and really do something with it. And I was very struck on the uh, opening night. So many people who were featured in the gallery said, you have no idea what it means to me that my story is on gallery. I mean, we forget that the authority and dignity of being involved in a museum display means a lot to communities who might normally never be there. And it is, as you say, a, sort of a, a, a big new kind of a, a dimension to what museums can do. And how does that sit as part of the narrative of the Science Museum and part, uh, in, in relation to the broader collection? Well, um, I, 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 I suppose that the, the thing about the medical collection is that, that when it arrived, it changed the way the Science Museum saw its task, because actually, when you're talking about medicine, you have to embrace fully social history. And so before the medicine collection arrived, the Science Museum was very much about people who were already quite knowledgeable about science, okay? And so actually the, uh, the, the galleries are a celebration of incredible social history and sociology. And actually, uh, I think, you know, some of my colleagues might have thought at first, you know, we should uh, be very much what I call a textbook on the wall. But actually the history of medicine is not one of completely straightforward triumph. Um, you know, we, for example, we tell the thalidomide story, which is one of the greatest scandals in medicine. So I think the, the honesty and um, truthfulness about the fact that medicine has been many triumphs and some disasters gives, I think, a much fuller social history and a much more truthful story about science. So often the story of science seems like it's one great invention after another, but actually that is not a true story and not a historical truth. Well, triumphal disaster is an interesting kind of way to move on to my next question to you, which is that um, I think you announced recently that the Science Museum will become a vaccination centre for um, the coronavirus vaccine. Um, and so your spaces will in a way kind of witness the actuality of um, a, a huge uh, experiment in medicine that, that we will all be living through and experiencing ourselves as well. Um, and you also have plans to collect objects relating to the pandemic. So uh, a quick question to you, what do you think the role, this is just, just a really quick question, what do you think the role of museums <laughs> and galleries are during this exceptional time as we live through the medical as well as social as well as economic as well as cultural emergency that we're living through? Well the thing that is very extraordinary, I mean first of all the way I would put it is my experience as director of the Science Museum of what we're going through can best be described as bittersweet. And what I mean is that actually we've all got to the stage where relatives and dear friends have died. We've all been touched by it. And so the personal tragedy is great. There's another side of me, which is seeing innovations in science, which are spellbinding. Okay. And so um, one of the things that's been very interesting is that we're actually living through the history we're, we're, we're living it and collecting it. And one of the things that's very interesting, early on we decided we wanted to collect the vaccines, the new ventilation technology as it was happening. And some of my colleagues said, well, we don't want to distract the medics from their work. But in fact, the response of the science world tells you everything, that actually we have had eminent people in the science world hand delivering objects in their spare time. And it tells you something that actually is the most amazing thing about the Science Museum. In the end, it's not for the public. 
it's for scientists because actually for the scientists and the nurses we're talking to i cannot tell you jenny how much it means to them that we care about what they're doing and we're collecting it people have done extraordinary things for us i suppose the other thing that we're very much engaged with is i would encourage everyone to read the blogs on our website by roger highfield our science director because we're obviously doing our bit to deal with what i call the enemy and this is a very strong way of putting it but clearly you can imagine my feeling about the anti-vaccination brigade and we have on gallery a wonderful display that makes a simple point that you look at jenna onwards vac vaccines have been one of the greatest triumphs of human discovery i mean i mean if you look at the world that was beset by polio for example which we talk about in the gallery so we are doing everything both to honor and respect our scientists and nurses but also doing our bit without hectoring people to say come on just look at the evidence of history and let's pull together and actually take this vaccine. Gosh, the idea of you know people hand delivering to you, because of course these these objects, the first of this and then experiment in that, are going to be precious objects in the future. It's going to be a, a fascinating um, way to see how you make that into you know the next uh, part of the display over the next few years. Yeah. So Ian, thank you so much. Thank you for joining. My pleasure. Me. My pleasure. I, I would love to talk to you for longer, but I'm like <laughs> over to uh, my colleague, Rachel Browning, Head of Programme Development at Art Fund, who is going to introduce our panellists and continue the discussion. And I, I'm now going to join you all as members of the audience. So I very much look forward to seeing you again at our next event. Thank you, Ian. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Jenny and Ian. Um, hello, everyone. As Jenny mentioned, I'm Rachel I'm from Art Fund, and it's a real pleasure to be hosting this panel discussion for our art partners and friends of Art Fund this evening. I'd like to begin by asking our panel to appear magically um, and to introduce themselves and their organisations. We've got three fantastic panellists to, uh, tonight joining us um, and uh, we can't wait to get stuck in. So I will kick off with you, Colin, if that's all right. Would you just introduce yourself to, to the group here this evening? Sure, yes, I'm uh, Colin Gale, as you can see from the screen there. I'm the director of Bethlehem Museum of the Mind. I guess in compared to the other institutions that are represented today, we're the, we're the smallest, we're a bit of a minnow. Uh, and it may be that you've never heard of us before, but if you have, it may have been in the connection that we were one of the uh, finalists of the 2016 uh, Art Fund Prize. Uh, and we're a museum of uh, mental health, a museum of psychiatry uh, based on a working hospital site. Great, thank you. And now, um, Steph, um, would you like to introduce yourself? I would, thank you, Rachel. Um... Um, I'm uh, Steph Scholten. I'm director of the Hunterian at the University of Glasgow University Museum. Uh, at the same time, the oldest museum in Scotland. I will tell a bit more later on about that. Um, and um, with collections both of art and of science um, and built on the legacy of William Hunter, who was an anatomist and a doctor. Um, so medicine takes um, a logical place in our, uh, um, in, in our uh, displays and collections. Um, and um, um, we are particularly interested in the dilemmas uh, around the collections that we find ourselves confronted with um, in these times. Uh, different stories, so um, hopefully be able to give a few examples of that as well. That sounds Looking forward great. to it. Yeah, thank you. And then um, last but by no means least, um, Katie. Good evening, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I'm Katie Barrett, I'm the Curator of Art Collections at the Science Museum, working with Ian, who you've heard from. Um, and you've heard a lot about our new medicine galleries. We are obviously known as a museum that deals with science, technology, medicine, transport, media, but we also have a significant art collection. We've worked with artists in our galleries and displays for a long time, uh, and that's what I focus on. Great. Well, a huge thank you to you all for being here this evening. I, and I'm sure our audience, are really, really looking forward to hearing more about your collections. Um, just a reminder to our audience that you can get involved in the conversation by submitting your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. 
I'll try my best to get through as many of them as possible. Um, so without further ado, uh, Steph, let's come to you first. Um, as you mentioned, the Hunterian holds a wide range of objects in the collection, including medicine and anatomy. Um, please could you tell us more about that part of the collection and the work that you're doing to curate uh, medical and scientific objects as the world around us changes? Yes, I will do that. I have a small presentation that I ah. will uh, share um, with you. Um, Wonderful. Here we go. Um, that looks unfamiliar. Hold on. Oh, here we are. Sorry. Um, come on. Right. Um, so welcome. Um, to everybody, thank you for uh, being here to listen to us. Also, thanks to the Art Fund, who's a massive supporter of the work that we do in Glasgow. Um, I mentioned um, the Hunterian, maybe not a well-known name to many of you, but it is, in fact, the oldest uh, public museum in Scotland, built on the legacy of, of this man that you see in a portrait by Alan Ramsey, um, William Hunter, um, a successful medic um, in London, but Scottish born, um, um, the man who became uh, the male midwife to Queen Charlotte and delivered 13 of her 14 children uh, with her alive, which was rare um, at the time. Um, and you may know him better as the brother of John Hunter, whose collections are at the Royal College of Surgeons of England, uh, currently in, uh, under renovation, uh, I think still. Um, and his um, lifetime obsession and main scientific work was around the anatomy of the graphic uterus, so pregnancy. Um, very quick rundown of the history of the museum. Um, Hunter worked in London. He had an anatomy school that included a room that he called a museum in Great Will Whitmill Street in London um, in the third quarter of the um, 18th century. And after he died in 1783, he left his collection and um, some money to the University of Glasgow to create a museum. And he had very strong ideas what that museum should do. It should be an educational um, um, place for students particular uh, to learn and to uh, enjoy because both his art collections and his science collections, his other collections uh, were, um, um, were included. He had already amassed incredible amounts of collections across the spectrum that you can imagine. And I'll show you a few examples. Um, and in the end, in 1807, um, the first country museum was opened um, in Glasgow, um, near the high street in the old center of town, near the old university, um, uh, in a building by William Stark, classicist uh, building. Um, and then um, the university and the museum moved to Gilmore Hill in the West End of Glasgow in 1870. And that's where we are now. Um, you see on um, the top right is um, a bird's eye view of the university building by Gilbert Scott from 1870. And actually the apse in the middle is where the, and, and, and the, the spaces to the left of that are where the current Hunter Museum is. That's where you saw me before. Um, uh, virtually situated in my museum, the main gallery of that museum. Um, and we added in 1980 the Hunter Art Gallery, um, William Whitfield's uh, uh, Brutalist Building, where our art collections are on display. That includes also the Macintosh House, the reconstructed interiors of Charles Rennie Macintosh's private residence uh, with his wife, uh, Margaret MacDonald. And since 2016, we uh, occupy a state-of-the-art collection study center um, in Kelvin Hall, that um, also an iconic building in Glasgow that holds um, our stores, um, laboratories, uh, research spaces, uh, seminar rooms, etc. cetera. Um, there's two more museums on campus in Glasgow, the Anatomy Museum that holds one of the oldest anatomy collections in the UK, I would believe, Sir William Hunter's. Um, and a zoology museum, um, more run of the mill, I would say, uh, but it's part of the, uh, the biology uh, faculty of the university. Um, 
we have art collections, as mentioned, um, some of the paintings really well known. There's the Lady Taken Tea by Chardin that was already part of William Hunter's founding collection. There's Great Whistlers, Glasgow Boys, Old Masters, um, and of course the work of Charles Rennie Mackintosh, um, but also many other collections. So um, some examples, anthropology, archaeology, numismatics, um, um, anatomy, geology, paleontology, medicine, um, history of science, um, basically everything that you can imagine, and then times 1.5 million, because that's the number of specimen that we have in our collections. Um, the, um, I, I was saying that I, I would briefly, and, and maybe when we have a discussion, we can talk a bit more about that. I, I would like to give you two examples of um, the kind of contemporary issues that we have, um, um, that we need to address when, when we work with and display our collections. And um, on the screen, you see, um, I hope um, I should have maybe given a content warning, but these are actually products of the research that William Hunter did in the 18th century um, um, into um, um, pregnant, human pregnancy. And what he did is he acquired, procured the bodies of dead pregnant women and they were dissected and they were drawn and they were cast and they were published and they were also um, parts of the, the, the bodies were, were, um, cre uh, were conserved as specimen. Um, and one of the interesting questions is that these objects have been in use for over 200 years, basically in the university as teaching materials, etc. And never any question has been asked, but only in recent years, the sensitivities around, you know, these, these very graphic and violent objects in a sense um, um, have, have um, um, made us much more aware about the sensitivities um, that these objects have in, in the current day and age, um, especially um, when talking about um, violence to women, um, um, uh, issues of consent, of course, non-consent given in those day, that, that day and age. Um, but also, um, 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 I would say that the, the question is being raised if any of these kind of objects should actually be on display, um, um, with which I don't agree. So one example that we can go into later. And my last um, uh, slide and example is this. Um, museums of science, they, and um, Ian Blatchford spoke of that as well, they tend to tell the hero stories um, of you know, the triumphs of science. They try, they tell about the heroes, the, the great successes, um, and they rarely talk about the people themselves. Um, and as an example, um, you may remember that um, two years ago, it was the bicentenary of James Watt's death, if I say that correctly, yes. Um, um, and he was celebrated across the UK as a big hero um, um, inventor um, that we know from the invention of the steam machine. Um, but actually his story is possibly slightly more complicated and death definitely has become more complicated in the past uh, two years. Um, the, the story is, is that the gentleman on the left, Alexander McFarlane, was a dispossessed Gale who went to the West Indies and became a rich and successful plantation owner and slaveholder in Jamaica. Um, he dabbled in science and bought a great collection of, of scientific instruments that upon his death, he donated to the University of Glasgow. And the University of Glasgow uh, hired this young instrument maker called James Watt to look after those instruments. Um, James Watt himself, descendant of a family that made his money basically from the slave business um, his um, family uh, owned ships um, and were involved in the trading of humans um, as well. Um, um, and, um, um, but James Watt became this instrument maker, came to Glasgow and had to work on the object you see the bottom um, of the screen, which is the model for the new Cohen engine. And this is a, an old fashioned early model of a steam engine. Um, and this is, so the story goes, the, the, the object that gave James Watt the idea of his innovations to the steam machine. So it become 
would become the driver of the industrial revolution. Um, however, we, we know from recent research by historians in Glasgow that James Watt was also involved personally in the trading of people, the trafficking of people. Um, and um, all of a sudden we wonder what stories we should tell about James Watt in our museum. And with that, I stop my, uh, my talk and hand over to one of my colleagues. Thank you, Steph. That's a fascinating insight into, um, into your collections. And yeah, we, we would definitely um, love to come back to, to, to grappling some of, those, um, some of those issues that you raise um, later in this discussion. Lots and lots of food for thought there. So thank you very much. Um, uh, Katie, maybe I could come to you now. Um, at the start, we heard from Ian about the Science Museum's new medicine galleries and their origins, their uh, renovation. As the curator of art collections, you've worked with artists who created new art commissions that responded to these galleries, um, including the wonderful work by uh, Jenny Holzer for Science, commissioned with Art on Support, we're very proud to say, um, in 2018 and unveiled in the galleries last uh, December. Um, where we, could you tell us a bit more about the process of working with artists in, in kind of commissioning new works for the galleries and how contemporary work fits within a display of medical objects and collections? Happily, Rachel, thank you. So I too have some images um, because much better for you to see some wonderful images of artworks than me. Um, so one second, apologies, for some reason it's not giving me the right option, there we go. So hopefully you can now see my screen. Um, so yeah, I'm in the quite lucky position that Ian has obviously already told you a little bit about our galleries, so I don't need to give you too much background. So I'm going to dive straight in to tell you about the five art commissions um, that we have in the space and then um, also as, talk a little bit about what, what we think they add to that experience. So as Rachel mentioned, sorry, my slides now aren't moving on. Ah, there we go. Um, we were really delighted in December uh, last year to launch the fifth and final commission for Medicine the Welcome Galleries um, called For Science by Jenny Holzer. We're very grateful for Art Fund's support in commissioning this work as well as to the Henry Moore Foundation. And this piece sits in our Faith, Hope and Fear Gallery. I think Ian mentioned there are five thematic galleries to, um, to the Medicine Galleries as a whole. And this gallery looks at essentially all the non-medical elements that contribute to our health. So it's quite a dark, sombre space. It has a lot of emotion for our visitors to process. Um, and Holtz's piece provides a place for rest and reflection and for touch and discussion. So the commission is a pair of benches made out of silver cloud granite um, and inscribed with text. So the, the stone was chosen particularly because it evokes monuments and memorials. You can see it's got a really beautiful grain to it. Um, and the text is sandblasted into the seats. So it has a, there's a real sense of, you can obviously sit on them, visitors can touch them. You can really feel the text um, in the benches. And the, there's a different text on each bench and they make you think about essentially about how society shapes our experiences of illness and treatment. One is by Susan Sontag and an uh, American writer and thinker, and the other by Paul Kalanithi, who was a doctor. And they're both writing in response to living with cancer. Um, and they, so they're giving you words to think with and Holzer has described them for us in her text that um, accompanies these benches, um, describes their words as expansive and frank. And I think they're particularly significant for us in, um, in allowing people to think about a disease like cancer as important in many ways as, as the pandemic which we're living through. So the work adds a really significant contemporary female artist to our displays and to our permanent collection. These, these benches have joined our permanent collection, as well as a very different type of sculpture. Most of our sculpture is uh, busts of, of doctors, um, continuing the theme that, that Ian has already mentioned. So it helps to tie into the kind of sculptures that people might associate more with a gallery that's about faith, hope and fear, gravestones, um, memorials, those, those kind of works. Now, Holtz's piece joins four other commissions that are throughout the galleries. Um, and in fact, there are commissions in four out of the five gallery spaces and they connect into both our displays and collections in important ways. 
Um, Sean Davy, the photographer, produced a series of life-size photographs for us that appear in both uh, the Medicine and Bodies Gallery and in Medicine and Treatments. And they were part of um, the very important um, move, which Ian mentioned, to make people really visible in the galleries and, and patients in particular. So um, you can hopefully see from this installation shot, these photographs are life-size. Um, so they're foregrounding individual people stories. Um, Davy worked as a psychotherapist for many years before she turned to photography. And her work regularly engages with different kinds of mental landscapes and particularly with people who might be out, seen outside as the normal in whatever we might that think that would be in terms of society or medicine. And for this project um, in the Medicine and Bodies Gallery, she worked with a participation group um, that we developed uh, called When Medicine Defines What's Normal. Um, and they produced a series of portraits, both physical ones in the space, as you can see here, and also digital ones on accompanying kiosks, um, which are of a range of people living with different kinds of medical conditions. And the group worked with Sean to think about pose, clothing, colour palette, um, and choice of background colours, and also to um, argue for the idea of having two portraits of each sitter. So it's really giving a sense of multi multiple aspects of a personality and I'm giving you two examples on the screen here of, of Gifford at the top and, and Jamie at the bottom um, and this was part of discussions that, that the group had with Sean about the importance of giving a kind of multifaceted personality so in terms of the galleries and the collections they're also really important because they help us to think about portraiture in our collection um, again crucially diversifying uh, the kinds of people who are portrayed um, from doctors to patients um, in terms of um, the gender diversity types of medical experience that we that we are um, preserving. Our third commission is another sculpture. Um, this is by Eleanor Crook. It sits in the Faith, Hope and Fear gallery um, facing the Jenny Holzer, in fact. Um, and this is a really beautiful bronze and wax sculpture, which is both a surgeon and a saint. And Crook's idea was that she would offer a, an imagined patron saint of medicine that combines faith with treatment. Um, we, we set her a very hard brief, which was to provide a space for people to think about death and what might make a good death. But she really rose to the challenge. So this piece weaves iconographies from medicine and religion together, and it draws a lot on our collection. Um, so the stethoscope that the saint is wearing becomes a rosary and the surgeon's mirror becomes a monstrance. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and the skirt is covered in amulets, uh, which connect to um, amulets that are on display elsewhere in the gallery, but also to the history of the project, because Eleanor asked people involved to suggest an amulet that she might include. So, for instance, slightly gruesomely, there is a, a, a severed thumb on the skirt because someone working at the foundry uh, nearly lost their thumb in the process of producing the piece. I'm glad to say not, not in the long run, um, but there are also items to do with pregnancy, tennis injuries, um, and in my case there is somehow Eleanor managed to make a retainer brace, a uh, dental retainer brace look beautiful and include it on the skirt at my request. And you can see that the, the bronze skirts shelter this rather delicate wax figure, you can see a detail of it um, on one side of the screen. And um, the idea is that this figure sits between life and death, sickness and health, drawing on all the kinds of references that Eleanor has elsewhere in the statue and that it is the saint of both healing, uh, sorry, treatment and faith who is protecting um, this figure. So this piece particularly responds to the kind of religious objects and iconography that are found in the welcome collections that Ian mentioned. They're very rich and broad medical collections, um, but though the, this kind of imagery isn't very much in the art collection currently. Um, but it also really draws on the strong histories, um, material histories that art and medicine share in terms of the, the bronze and the wax that, that Crook works with, which are so important to different kinds of objects in, um, in both art and science. Um, our third commission is um, a monumental bronze sculpture by the British artist Mark Quinn. It's the first thing that many visitors will see because it um, stands at the um, main front entrance to Medicine, the Welcome Galleries. And it's six metres tall. Um, it seems to stand very lightly on the floor, but there is in fact a huge amount of engineering, I can assure you, that goes into this. Um, and like Santa Medicina, it, it asks to be touched and we encourage people to touch and interact with this sculpture. And Quinn is representing 
um, a man called Rick Ganest, um, who may be known to some of you. He, he was an actor, model and muse. He's best known for appearing in Lady Gaga's video for Born This Way. And Ganest, um, following a brain tumour in his early teens, which he uh, recovered from, he started to cover his body in tattoos. You can see some close ups of this um, on the slide. And he, he mixed anatomical imagery and common tattooing iconography. So things like spiders, webs, gravestones, insects, the classic kind of lettering on the knuckles, um, making himself both a kind of a cauchy figure that is well known in, in art history and medicine, but also really essentially a kind of decaying corpse with the kind of classic art historical imagery of decaying corpse as memento mori. And Marx talks really compellingly about how he feels this sculpture acts to bring street culture into the museum. So things like tattooing, pop, fashion, um, and giving, a, giving visitors a way to see themselves in the displays. But I think importantly for me, it also connects the visual culture of something like tattooing into art historical and medical imagery. And you can see that the figure of Ganesh holds a book, which is labeled an anatomy of the human body. And it uses very famous historical, um, histor <coughs> excuse me, historic anatomical imagery from Vesalius is on the fabric of the human body, which was a groundbreaking book for its anatomy, but also for its use of, of visual um, works. The last commission <clears throat> is um, one that I think shows us really poignantly how works of art can change over time, and particularly how you can't prepare for what the ongoing impact of a work might be. So this is a piece called Bloom by the Danish design studio, Studio Rosso. And it's a huge kinetic sculpture that hangs from the ceiling of our medicine and communities gallery. And it was intended to help our visitors think about the spread of a pandemic disease. Um, the gallery as a whole is about how disease and medicine work at a community level rather than a personal level. So the sculpture evokes a large diagram in a textbook or a scientific paper, each branching structure ends in a series of propellers and these spin and light up and change color in a series of different um, imagined narratives of how a disease might spread. So each propeller might be a person or a city or a country and diseases sometimes spread low, slowly, very quickly. Some colors are quite vibrant, some of them fade. They may stop perhaps as someone has recovered or sadly passed away. And it serves to give a really compelling sense of the scale at which health and medicine operate at a group level. But of course, when we commissioned um, and installed this in sort of 2017 to 2019, it was in a context where we felt visitors would need help to visualize the idea of a pandemic disease and how it might spread and to tie into the kinds of diagrams and visuals that are used to communicate that. Um, in 2021, pandemic diseases are of course all too familiar to us and we're very good at reading the kinds of diagrams and graphics that we get shown in daily government briefings. So instead I think it's interesting how this piece has become a more kind of quiet reflective space, perhaps offering the gentle lights and colours as a way to think about the huge medical experience that we all now share from the last year and a bit. So as a whole, to answer your question, Rachel, in the medicine galleries, the Contemporary Art Commission's work in multiple ways um, to connect visitors to visual material and personal histories of medicine. They link imagery from different areas of art and science. I think they speak to questions and offer voices and faces that haven't previously been represented in our collections. And they give, most importantly, I think, they give a visual means for our visitors to think about how medicine is shaped by society. I'll leave it there. That's great. Thank you so much. And um, I feel that we're doing okay for time. So I'm just going to jump in with a very quick question for you, Katie, that, um, because it's um, related to the, the Holzer um, that's come in on the Q&A, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, a little... Now, so let me do it. So, um, yeah, if, if you could just answer this literally in a, in a couple of minutes, which I'm sure you'll be, you'll be able to do, and then and then we can move on and, and hear from Colin. Um, so a question to Katie about the Holzer Commission, which is clearly quite tactile. Once museums reopen, will this have to be barriered off in light of slash COVID slash hygiene purposes? And does that mean the work changes its purpose? Now, of course, you've already gone through this um, in terms of um, the museum being reopened um, uh, at sort of autumn last year. So maybe you could just, uh, yeah, Talk to us for a couple of couple of minutes just on on what what you had to do in terms of the commissioned works. 
Sure. So, yes, we were lucky that the commission was um, available for people to visit for about two weeks in December. Um, so we, we had a lot of conversations with our in-house conservation team and with um, Jenny Holtz's studio about this. And um, we all felt that it was really intrinsically important that this sculpture is is open to be sat on and, and touched. Um, it would be very strange to have benches in a gallery with with barriers around them. So, um, and, and, you know, we have a number of um, objects and interactives in the museum that, that are similarly quite important. So um, essentially we have an enhanced cleaning regime which is um, appropriate to objects and to the, the specific material needs of the objects. So the benches will still be accessible, um, but they will be with um, COVID secure. That's great, thank you. Um, and really, really reassuring, um, I'm sure for people to hear who haven't um, yet been back into our wonderful galleries. Um, great, thank you. Um, Colin, um, hand over to you now. Um, so Bethel Museum of the Mind, which I very much enjoyed visiting um, as a museum, a museum of the Year finalist back in 2016. It's a really exceptional museum which explores the history of art and mental health care on the site of the Bethlehem Royal Hospital. Um, aside from the devastating clinical effects, we're only just beginning to grapple with some of the ramifications that COVID-19 will have on people's mental health and their well-being. As we've already heard today, museums and their collections will play a key role in helping us understand the pandemic. So Colin, could you tell us a bit more about your museum and the collection, how you engage with vis visitors and work with patients to learn about the history of mental health care and how art can play a role in understanding this? I think you've got some slides for us too, don't you? I have, uh, but they're being controlled not by me, but by <laughs> art fund colleagues. And I will move them on by the phrase of 2020. Next slide, please. Um, it's a pleasure for me, an honour for Bethlehem Museum of the Mind to be taking part in this event. And in what I'm about to say, I, I shan't assume any no, prior knowledge of the museum. So as has been said though, the museum is located on the site of a working psychiatric hospital in the southeastern suburbs of London, which happens to be the oldest psychiatric institution with a continuous history that is still open for business uh, in the world, uh, Bethlehem Royal Hospital commonly known by its variant form of the name uh, Bedlam. Uh, the museum's location at the heart of the hospital gives it a clear orientation towards its on-site uh, stakeholder groups of mental health service users, as well as hospital staff. But alongside this, it maintains a strong outward focus to its local community and the wider museum going public. Uh, the museum's collections are made up of three strands. First of all, it's historic archives uh, comprising medical and administrative records covering several centuries, maps, plans, and photographs and all that kind of stuff. Secondly, artifacts illustrating the material culture of hospital life, the things that were made and used and uh, not thrown away afterwards in the course of the hospital's work. And these include objects, sometimes quite challenging objects, such as chains and ECT machines uh, that relate directly to the history of psychiatric treatment, as well as items that illustrate hospital life more generally, such as milk bottles from the hospital farm or air raid warden's helmets. Next slide. Uh, lastly, and perhaps most importantly, however, we care for a collection of over a thousand artworks. So compared to other institutions we've heard from tonight, a fairly small collection, uh, but, uh, uh, perfectly formed and mostly these are by patients, uh, former patients or current patients of the hospital. The collection spans 200 years and gives access to a range of perspectives on mental health and ill health and the experience of being on the receiving end of mental health care. And it's this collection I think especially that gives us the opportunity to do more with our museum displays than simply the traditional thing, simply presenting an institutional version of the history of the hospital. Uh, and it gives us a chance to open up a range of perspectives that uh, is as wide as the artist's field of vision and to suggest questions for discussion, which are as much, much to do with the present and future of mental health care as they are with, as with the past. Like many museums, we have permanent displays which rarely change and temporary display areas, you're looking at one of them now, in which exhibits are regularly rotated. And we use the opportunity of these temporary areas to address 
topical issues associated with mental health. The permanent displays are themselves curated so as to bring the past and the present into conversation with one another. We haven't put, in other words, we haven't put all the art in one corner and all the art archives in another and the artifacts somewhere else. Instead, we've identified themes in mental health care and used the collections as these themes. Uh, not with a view to telling people what to think, actually, but to promote thought and discussion of issues that very often people would rather avoid. Like all other museums, our ability to provide public access to our displays has been challenged by the coronavirus pandemic. We've only been able to open our doors for four of the past 10 months. But again, like other museums, while retaining the aspiration to reopen as soon as we can do so uh, safely and legally, we've also pivoted towards digital content delivery via enhanced social media uh, engagement, production of online videos, development of a program of online events and research projects. And most recently by the launch of a 360 degree tour as part, uh, of part of our premises. Could I have the next slide? Actually, if you lose, if you allow me to use my presentation to shamelessly promote this tour, uh, that, that's the thing I'd like to do. Uh, all you need to do is go onto our web, Google Bethlehem Museum of the Mind, um, Google um, that, uh, land on the home page, go to what's on, then on exhibitions, and there you can find our uh, wonderful uh, new digital tour. The pandemic has prompted Bethlehem Museum of the Mind to bring forward another number of initiatives to purposefully engage our on-site community of mental health service users, including a research project called Change Minds Online, which brings the historic medical records of Bethlehem Hospital together with people with contemporary experience of mental distress via a series of Zoom sessions to provide opportunities for new perspectives to emerge both on the history of mental health care and the life, individual life histories of participants. Could I have the next slide? Uh, alongside the 360 degree tour, the exhibition section of the museum's website contains a digital exhibition of the narratives that were constructed as part of the last time we ran this program. And we just want to run it again and again. We think it's wonderful. Our forward program of temporary exhibitions has also been affected by the coronavirus pandemic, most obviously by it being subject to delay and disruption, but there's been a positive impact as well in terms of the heightened awareness around issues of well-being over the past 12 months. Some of Bethlehem's partner museums of psychiatry on the European continent, and yes, there are some, have decided to curate exhibitions that are directly on the subject of coronavirus. And uh, I haven't got a slide for this, but I might name check one of them. Museum Overtashi uh, in Aarhus in Denmark. Uh, and in particular, their sort of social media presence uh, on Facebook have done a wonderful uh, job of addressing this. Uh, most recently, they've um, a, a, a alerted us to the fact that the, the pandemic has introduced many more people to the kinds of fears that are often shared by people with certain mental health conditions, fears such as I'm alone, I'm locked up, I'm scared, uh, I'm powerless, I have no control over my situation, I can't face the future, I don't know what it holds. So a uh, wonderful thing, another thing to check out on social media. We don't have plans to address the pandemic directly in our forward program, but we do have plans to for, uh, bring forward exhibitions that look at aspects of well-being that have a higher profile now than they've had in the past. For example, in the spring, we have an exhibition planned that will examine the positive impact for mental health on access to the natural environment, the great outdoors. And to do this, we'll be using the artworks of Thomas Hennel, a landscape painter of the 1930s, a one-time hospital patient. Just turn on to the next slide if we could. So to be clear, the aim of that exhibition won't simply be art historical, it won't simply be an exhibition of the works of Thomas Hennel. Instead, it will be an exhibition that draws attention to and asks questions about the well-being potential of his landscapes and the great outdoors. Then in the summer, we hope to put on show the works of the great cat cartoonist Louis Wayne. Again, not for their own sake, but to throw into relief the contribution that's often made by domestic animals to people's well-being. And come the winter, we hope to launch an exhibition 
exploring the issues of how the issues of race play out in the mental health system. So this is all work in progress and there's still a lot to do. So far, we haven't brought forward any plans to create an exhibition on the mental health effects of COVID-19, as I've said, and the lockdown. Perhaps it's counterintuitive, but we're, I'm not best placed uh, here at Bethlehem to gauge what those effects might be any, in any way that, other than anecdotally uh, or in any better than anyone else could. All of us, of course, have stories about how the pandemic has affected our well-being and those around us. But we also have stories, I think, of how resilient people have proved to be in the face of COVID. Um, it's possible that our shared experience of a common adversity might actually operate to build resilience and to perhaps even to su suppress the spread of serious mental illness, as I understood stand it did in the London, um, London Blitz in 1940 against psychiatrists' expectations. I suspect we won't know either way for some time yet. Next slide. In the meantime, I think that museum staff will do well to consider their work in continuing to engage with their audiences in spite of all the obstacles in the way of doing so as a form of essential service. I sincerely believe that things like that 360 degree tour and our Change Minds Online project and our social media content and all the rest is making a small but significant positive contribution to the well being of our audiences and also that the work of museum staff, those you've heard from today and other museums up and down the country to engage with their audiences is doing the same thing. Well, th that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colin. And yes, a sort of a, a silver lining there that I think that we can all hope for in terms of the, the sort of pandemic bringing us together. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for sharing your collections and your insights with us. Um, I know we could spend stacks more time discussing uh, your fascinating museums, but I'm keen to open up the discussion a little. Um, hearing from you has certainly sparked a few questions off in my mind, and I know we've got some from the audience that have come in. So um, let's try and uh, whip through at least a, a couple. I've been given permission to run over by five minutes, I'm going to take it. Um, so first, um, a question to you all. Given the events of the last 18 months, including COVID and its medical developments, as well as social and political movements like Black Lives Matter and Me Too, how do you see the work of your museums adapting and how has this changed the relationship with your visitors? And is the function of your museum changing in response to current events? And I wonder, Steph, if you wanted to, to kick off with that. I know that you've got a new um, curator of discomfort who's just uh, started and posted at the Hunter Inn. She did indeed. Um, 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 we're, we're on a bit of a journey, I, I think, um, um, in the sense that we were thinking about redeveloping our museum anyway, because most of our permanent displays are 15 or more years old, and we've got a lot of work to do. But we were, we've definitely been prompted by, I think in general, over the past few years already by events um, and by shifting opinions that we see a lot from our student body as well. Mm -hmm. Where young people come in with you know, a, a, a different mindset, different ideas about things and, and bringing those to the fore in the discussions that we have with them. So um, our program is massively impacted and, and um, the Curating Discomfort Project helps us as a thinking model to look at different aspects in our collections, um, how we can talk about them, how we can share authority around the narratives that we present about those objects to, to, to think about alternatives, engage of course with communities around these objects. Unfortunately, we've planned a lot of um, events to or, or engagement events with uh, with uh, specific groups, which have all been kind of thwarted by the COVID pandemic, and uh, so we've pushed them back more towards the end of the project. But um, um, we we will start with creating interventions in our existing um, um, exhibitions, um, but also programming in a different way than we've done before. Um, so yeah, a big, big impact. Great, thank you. And Katie, from the Science Museum's um, perspective, um, what, what, yeah, obviously you've just finished this massive project and congratulations, um, we don't want to detract from that, but, but what, what's next and how will you, the function of your museum sort of shift in, um, in relation to um, uh, current events? 
Yeah, I think one one thing for us, and, and like many museums, that is that um, the pandemic and the, the long term impact it's going to have on things like objects traveling is it's making us focus back on our collections um, away from, you know, loan exhibitions. Obviously, we, we will continue to do those, but we're in the uh, fortunate in many ways position that we we are in any case um, moving the vast majority of our collection from a store in West London down to a new national collection centre in um, near Swindon. So we were already in the process of looking at all of our collections again, mm -hmm. photographing them, thinking about them differently and engaging with a, a new community, particularly in, in the Southwest. So it gives us a really nice opportunity to refocus on those collections and, and think about them a bit differently, including for instance, the, the welcome collections that we've mentioned a few times, which have a really wide, compared to other parts of the collection, have a much more global span in terms of the kind of stories we can tell. And I think focusing on those is gonna be something that's gonna become more and more important as the uh, time goes on. Great, thank you. Actually, I've got another um, specific question for, for um, the Science Museum that's popped through. So um, um, I'll just throw that in at the moment as well. So does the Science Museum have an exhibit on previous pandemics like the Spanish flu in 1918 to uh, 1920? Um, we don't have a, a specific display on on pandemics but they do feature in in the medicine galleries and there is a um a specific um section on on vaccination as well which is obviously very um uh very relevant to this and we are we we announced a couple of um a couple of weeks ago now i think that we have been able to acquire um one of the first vaccine vials used um in december uh, or the first vaccine vial used in December, which will be joining those collections. So even though the galleries are, are new, we are going to be also updating them to um, reflect some of the recent changes. Thank you. And Colin, just um, over to you for that, um, that uh, topic that we were talking about just a minute ago. So has the function of your museum changed in response to current events? Yes, well, of course, there've been all sorts of disruption and a, mm. a pivot to digital learning, as I've said. I think that the longer term learning outcomes will be around just keeping us sharp and then looking at our temporary exhibition programming and our events, et cetera, and making sure that those, um, what we're doing is actually addressing questions of contemporary uh, relevance, such as the one that sort of, uh, some of the ones that are embedded in the question there uh, around the, the kind of experience of the past few years. Um, it may seem, you, you might think we should be doing this anyway, but I guess we'll be just doubling our efforts to, and our, and our um, eh, appreciation that what we're doing is all about well-being, uh, mm -hmm. uh, both uh, for folk on the hospital site and outside it, um, and how we, what we do contribute to that, contributes to that. And then I think whether this is a direct outcome of COVID or not, um, something, a, a, a strategic kind of shift for us will be uh, much more in the direction that we've already, there's a journey we're on at the moment to make sure that our curation is truly collaborative. Uh, you know, that idea that uh, nothing about us without us, you know. So um, uh, in our context, that's really very important. And uh, but, so I guess they're the, they're the things we, uh, the responses we, we, we expect we'll be making. Great, thank you. I'm going to squeeze in um, one more question that's po that's popped in, um, and um, I'm going to ask um, Katie to to kickstart this conversation if that's all right. So, do you think there'll be more interest in scientific collections now the public are more aware following COVID? I think it's a great question. Um, I think certainly science and I think med medicine are things that we've all become possibly more immediately aware of um, over the last year. But that said, we all have medical experiences throughout our, our lives, now, you know, of, of a whole kind of different degrees. And I think that's one of the things that's so brilliant about medical museums is that everyone brings their own story and their own connections. Um, and so perhaps we maybe all have more immediate experiences. And I think, um, I think the interesting thing now, I think Ian touched on this as well, is how our museums can help people to, to process those experiences when we go back to the normal, whatever, whatever normal ends up looking like, um, and how, how we begin to incorporate the experiences of this pandemic into our displays and what, 
how we do that for the best in a way that is supportive and um, and forward thinking at the same time as, as acknowledging the, the, the importance of these kind of events. Thank you. And Steph, I saw you nodding sagely there. So do you have any thoughts here? Oh, you're on mute. Buzz, buzz phrase of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, sorry, the, um, no, no, I, I don't have a lot to, to add there. I was thinking about something else though. Oh, yes. Um, um, because we still have a lot of dead people on display, sort of, mm. in bits, usually, um, which, which is definitely, you know, makes sense in the context of a medical museum, makes sense in the context of science museums, and definitely with an anatomist as a founding uh, father. Um, however, you know, the way we do that, again, and the way we can use those collections to evidence older pandemics and diseases. Um, um, I, th I think we, we, we need to give that a very good think. Yeah, and that's a, that's a topic that um, I think museums up and down the country are, are grappling with at the moment. You know, it's, it's something that's come up, at, for example, in relation to the Pitt Rivers Museum quite recently. Yeah. It's um, not just our sort of medical collections, but also our sort of ethnographic holdings. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid we are out of time. I think we could have <laughs> carried on carried on talking for at least another hour. Um, uh, it went super quickly, as these things always do when you're when you're enjoying yourself. So so thank you all so so much for joining us this evening. Um, and to our audience, thank you very, very much as well. Um, we've been um, really lucky to hear about um, a selection of brilliant medical and scientific collections. Um, and um, yeah, we are, we are eager to hear more. Um, as we all know, it's still an incredibly difficult time for museums. Um, with every day they remain closed, um, it makes the challenges that they face even greater. And I'm sure like me, um, everyone here is looking forward to when we can visit them in person again. Um, I'm delighted to say that our crowdfunding campaign together for museums um, has raised uh, much needed funds to support our museum sector, but we still need to raise more. So we still need more of your generous support. So please do consider donating if you haven't already. Um, you can find more information on our website, artfund.org. Um, and lastly, a huge thank you to Jenny and to Ian for kicking us off, to Katie, Colin and Steph for joining us and to every single person in our audience for participating. Goodbye and have a wonderful evening.